Food is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, underate, overate, or overtrained and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy. You can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level. To stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Hi fans, welcome to another episode of the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. I'm here today with my fellow teammate here on the Rise Up Nutrition team, Mackenzie Bowman. Hey Mackenzie. Hello, thank you for having me on. I'm excited to chat with you today. (laughs) Yes, finally. So I just want to read off a little bit of like your bio just to help our listeners get to know you. So Mackenzie is a registered dietitian and sports nutritionist and intuitive eater. In addition to Rise Up, Mackenzie currently works at Prosperity Eating Disorder and Wellness. And the last few years, she was the assistant director of sports nutrition at Wake Forest University for their collegiate athletes. Prior to Wake Forest, Mackenzie was a clinical dietitian, which, as we all know, is a great foundation of nutrition expertise before going into any sort of specialization, which of course she now is. Mackenzie is a certified nutrition support clinician. She has her master's degree in applied nutrition and physical activity from Virginia Tech. She has completed Marcy Evans eating disorder training and is a body project facilitator, helping people improve their body image. In this episode, you're just going to learn more about Mackenzie, get to know her and her passion for nutrition. Maybe we'll even talk volleyball or yoga, which are two of Mackenzie's passions. But I think you'll understand why she's such a great coach for the ladies in our programming. So I just really am excited to have this conversation, just a fun, casual conversation with Mackenzie to have you guys listen to her and and understand another dietitian's like perspective and point of view. So yeah, Mackenzie, let's just dive right into it. I'd love to ask you first, like where did your passion for nutrition first begin? Yeah, awesome. So I feel like I have a very weird kind of path that got me here, (laughs) but I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. So I had a really strong, you know, science and math knowledge all through my younger years, was always in honors math and science in high school and everything, and really didn't know what I wanted to do when I uh, went to college. So get to that point and it's like, okay, what are you going to major in? I decided on engineering because I was like, okay, math and science, engineers make a lot of money. This sounds great. Wow. Get to college. (laughs) And my very first semester, I was a civil engineering major. And my English class, my like one non-engineering based class, I decided to write my research paper on eating disorders, actually. Hmm. So I realized I was like, why am I way more interested in this than all of the rest of my other homework? Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm not the type of person who can just like sit at a desk every day. Like, I really want to be working with people. I'm a people person. I want to help people. I want to talk to people. So I knew I kind of needed to make a shift. But at that point, I didn't know what dietetics was. I had never heard of it before. And so I confide a lot in my older sister. And so I called her. I remember this was like after volleyball practice. I called her and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, what should I do with my life, basically? And she mentioned dietetics and she was like, you should either major in dietetics and minor in psychology or major in psychology and minor in dietetics if you really are interested in eating disorders. And I was like, great idea. So looked into both, decided to go the dietetics realm and never looked back. And, you know, I think it's funny because like that really was the driving factor was like wanting to work with people with eating disorders that got me into dietetics. But then I didn't necessarily do that right away, you know, doing the clinical route first. And then obviously did it a little bit in clinical, started to do it more once I got into sports. And now that's really what I'm truly focusing on. So it's funny to see how it's kind of come full circle. Yeah. You know, it's also funny to hear your story about that. You wrote a research paper on it when you're an engineering major, because I, when I first got into nutrition, I always knew it would be for sport. 
So that was there. But I actually never thought it would be anything to do with disordered eating at all, which is a funny part of my story. And so when I started to put everything in my life together and really start to go down this path for my career to be helping athletes and then helping athletes with disordered eating, my mom, you know how moms kind of save everything (laughs) from your childhood. She like went in the closet or the attic, whatever, like pulled out all my old schoolwork because she remembered that in ninth grade, which was when I was first learning how to write a research paper, right? So it was the very first research paper I ever wrote in my life was on anorexia. And she like, and I got an A plus, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I got uh, a grade in my research paper too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so it was funny because I, I had an interest in it at that age and then totally like forgot about it. My interest was in sports and sports fully. And then, you know, then what, 15 years later, circle back like, whoa, that's what I'm doing. So that was kind of, so it is interesting how, you know what, we write about what we are passionate about. Absolutely. That's so funny because I've never heard of anyone else having like any sort of similar story, but look at that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. Plus civil engineering is just oh, incredibly hard. Not that nutrition isn't, but (laughs) you know, we did have to take organic chemistry, but oh my goodness, engineering majors. Wow. A different kind of hard. Computer science was not my friend. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So your, your passion kind of started with eating disorders, but then you got into, well, obviously as dietitians, we have to get into all nutrition, but sport, because then you're working as the, you know, assistant director. And am I right to say you're promoted to director? No, I was, I was an assistant and I was promoted to assistant director. Assistant director. Okay. So assistant director of sports nutrition at Wake Forest University. So what was your drive to do sports nutrition? Yeah. So obviously, like you mentioned earlier, being an athlete my whole life, sports have always been really, really important to me, something that I'm super passionate about. I'm also a huge Philadelphia sports fan. I grew up going to more games than I could even count. So they've always been such a big part of my life. And so that was something too, you know, initially, yes, eating disorders were that driving factor. But then once I kind of learned a little bit more about it and was like, wow, I can work in sports because that had always been something that kind of crossed my mind. But I was like, you know, I don't see myself being an athletic trainer or anything like that. And I didn't really know about sports dietetics. You know, it's still a relatively new field. And so when I kind of learned that I could combine those two passions, I was like, sports and food, those are two of my favorite things. So that's kind of how I, you know, ended up in this realm. And I was really fortunate with my dietetic internship through Airmark that for my community rotation, I was able to go to Notre Dame and do sports nutrition there. So that was kind of my first taste of sports nutrition. Yeah, because they have a a big athletics department there at Notre Dame and as well as uh, sports dietitians on staff there. How many do they have, actually? Do you know? When I was there, they had three. Three, yeah. I'm not sure if they have more now. Yeah, which is a big deal, you know, as you know, as you know, and I know, but our listeners might not. Now at like division one universities, yes, there are sports dietitians, but our D2, D3 schools are still really struggling to have any. And then most universities, you might get one. If they have a dietitian, you might have one. And so some of these more notable uh, schools and athletic programs like Notre Dame have three. Like that's a really big deal. And that's why then you get to take your rotation there and get experience and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's been interesting to kind of see because like you said, like so many different schools kind of have like some of them have four dietitians. Some of them have two full time and two fellows. You know, that's what we had at Wake. So it really does vary a little bit. But I think it makes a huge difference when you do have more dietitians because you get to actually focus more on the counseling component, the supplement stuff, the injury stuff versus when you have less, you kind of fall more into the, okay, well, we have to do this food service component. Yeah, that's what happens at that collegiate level. Yeah, if you only have one dietitian, they end up being, this is my opinion, I'm not saying it's the truth, but (laughs) almost like a glorified lunch lady because they have to coordinate all the food. So it's just like coordinating food for away games and for travel and at the dining halls and at the fueling stations. And then you're not doing the education or the counseling piece that is so, 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 so key. Exactly. I mean, every school is different, but that's been happening a lot, mostly due to like, what was it in 2014, the NCAA deregulated or changed their policies of deregulation of feeding where suddenly universities could provide food. Whereas prior to 2014, like an athletic department couldn't provide food to athletes. And then 
after 2014, they can. And so when every university is doing that, it's like you kind of have to just to keep up with it because yeah. otherwise, yeah, otherwise your your school is falling behind in recruiting and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, yeah. So it, got, it, becomes, it, got, it becomes the expectation. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What What was your favorite part about being a collegiate sports dietitian? Definitely the counseling aspect. And I think that's why I'm so excited about, you know, my new position. I think that because I have had that experience in clinical and then sports and then now going to be working at Prosperity, you know, I've, I've kind of done different things and I've liked different components of all of that. But what it comes down to is I love that relationship building. I love being able to see people progress, you know when these athletes come in and they're like, you know, I, I listened to you and I didn't cramp during the game or, you know, my disordered eating or eating disorder has gotten better, you know, seeing those things, that's the most impactful um, part. And that's the part that I've enjoyed the most, you know, I've spent a lot of time counseling, but I've also spent a lot of time making smoothies. And so I'm excited to focus on the counseling part. Yes. Right. Glorified lunch ladies, just, yes. you know, busting out those PB and J sandwiches and smoothies like all day long. <laughs> But yeah, so that is exactly why, Mackenzie, like that's one of the main reasons why I brought you onto the Rise Up Nutrition team was because of your counseling skills and your passion for one-on-one -on -one nutrition. And it's educating and empowering and building relationships, which is exactly what, you know, at what I've built this business on and really value that we do with our clients is I'm not, we're not just shoveling out meal plans. We're building relationships and we're helping clients reach their goals. And that comes with, I like to use the word coaching and it, our traditional clinical nutrition minds are like <laughs> nutrition counseling. And, but it, it's, it's coaching them. It's where's the client at and where, where are they trying to go? What are their goals and coaching them to get there week to week to week, session to session, you know, day in and day out. And that is something that like really came through when I met you that your passion for, it's so cheesy, but your passion for <laughs> really helping people really came through. Like this is about the person. It's not about the title. It's, you know, it's not about the food even. It's about helping <laughs> the person live a better life and through food, right? And um, so that's why we're so excited to have you on our team here at Rise of <laughs> Nutrition. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so excited to be part of the team. And it's nice to hear that like that was kind of your reasoning because that is truly how I feel. And so I'm glad that that kind of reflects. Yeah. And you know, I am, I like to be transparent. So with our listeners and stuff as to why, like I, I brought you on because for a while with this business, it was just me. And then we hired Jenna, who's been on the podcast in a couple of episodes. So I hired Jenna a year ago. Jenna has been working with me for a whole year now, which is great. And then this past fall, as I prepared for having a baby, I was like, Ooh, I might need a little bit more help. And so, so we, you know, interviewed a bunch of people and we found Mackenzie and as, as we said in your intro, like you do have another job, but this is one of those positions where your passion for this really like came through and it's something that we can build. So we brought you onto the team specifically to help with our Rise Up Nutrition group coaching program, which is to, you know, really help female athletes kind of stop strict dieting, but still feel great in their bodies and perform better. And it's really an individualized approach that we have towards nutrition and coaching these clients to their goals. And so your kind of flexibility, availability, and passion for doing exactly that is like you can help out with this group. And then in time, if business grows, Mackenzie might continue to grow with this business too, which mm -hmm. we would love because that's an interest of yours too, is like is private practice has always been so that was not, that was another reason that I was like, all right, this girl likes relationships, building likes relationships, building relationships <laughs> with her clients, private practice. And then you've got all that job experience. And of course you interviewed well. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. This is just yeah. a podcast episode complimenting me. I like yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I'm really trying to, to hype you up for our clients because the, you've done a great job, which actually speaking of, so, so you started with us in October and with the Rise of Nutrition Group Coaching Program, it is a three month initial program and that we bring our clients through. And so you actually just finished up working with a couple of our clients that started right in October when you started. I'd love to just hear from you what, you know, that experience was of going start to finish through a three-month program with your clients. 
Yeah, it was really, really amazing to see, you know, the impact that this program is able to have on someone in a relatively short period of time. You know, people can go years struggling with eating disorders and disordered eating and maybe even never get help. And, and you know, it can be a really long process. And intuitive eating especially is is really hard. That's something that even took me a while to to kind of get into. So being able to see someone make such drastic changes during that time was just so amazing. And just, you know, hear her talk about how this program really changed her life. You know, it's it's knowing that we were able to make an impact and that is just the best feeling in the world. So I'm excited to continue to see, you know, more clients make that progress. It is. And it's funny because sometimes I think when people chat with me and are interested in our programming and they hear, oh, three months, it sounds like a long time, but it goes by incredibly fast, and which is why one of our other programs is called the Fast Track. <laughs> it goes by <laughs> so fast. And when people are struggling, people struggle with nutrition for months and years and years and years. And that struggle can look like a variety of things from just, I have no clue how to eat to something like disordered eating or any, you know, anything. And it's like, Three months goes by so fast. And what you just said, Mackenzie, of like, wow, that was a huge impact. They really saw tons of change. And I have designed these programs this way because I think in all of my job experience of the past, I felt like it took so long to see change in people. You know, it just, I don't know if, if it's like the session to session type of thing or, or I don't, yeah, it just takes so long. <laughs> it does. And I mean, even with like athletes that I, you know, met with in the collegiate world, there were some athletes that I started meeting with back in April that I really didn't see true progress in until maybe end of summer or beginning of fall. You know, that's longer than three months. And I think that part of that is, you know, yes, they're getting that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with me every week or every other week, but having the group support is huge. I think that that's something that, you know, is, we don't really think about it. We're like, okay, you know, maybe I'll go see a dietitian and I'll get this one-on-one -on -one help. But if you're not surrounding yourself with people who understand and who support you and who are also trying to you know, reject diet culture and change their mentality, it, it can be really hard. So having kind of peers that are going through the same thing with you, I think really helps move things along. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the foundations of our group coaching program is there's other people. So there's me and Mackenzie coaching you through it. And then there's other female athletes and women who are going through the same process with you to share those experiences. And yeah, that's, that's super helpful too. So yeah, you're one of the clients that literally just finished the program yesterday. <laughs> Not only did she see such, I, I really will, she's, her words to me were, this was life-changing, which was awesome. And then yesterday she actually gave a public talk about her experiences on this to a, a group that she's a part of where they, you know, she's, got on the mic and talked about her experiences with this. So it really is. Mackenzie is doing life-changing work over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know she did that yesterday. That's, I'm so proud of her. Again, just, you know, love to see that progress and just kind of see where she's come from and knowing the things that she's had to deal with. So, yeah. So Mackenzie, I, I think we're, well, not we, I already know you, <laughs> but the <laughs> listeners are probably getting a good vibe of you right now, but I'd love to hear you know, if you could tell them a bit about your nutrition philosophy, which is such a loaded question, but uh, you always get asked, I'm pretty sure I asked you this on like your interview and stuff. And it's something that I think as dietitians, we all have to have one because we have to be like, when we're talking to clients, kind of, we can't be wishy-washy and say one thing to one person, one to another. So tell our listeners a bit about your nutrition philosophy. Yeah. So obviously firm believer, you know, food is fuel. That's kind of the, the classic sports dietitian thing. But at the same time, for me, like food is also fun. Food, food is, you know, time spent with family and friends. I personally love cooking. So like, it's something that has, again, always kind of been a big part of my life. It's something I really enjoy. And, you know, I think being, you know, so into the intuitive eating component of things and all foods fit, like those are all really important components to me. And that was one of the reasons that, you know, when I saw your job posting, I was like, okay, this is something I'm actually interested in because our philosophies do align. You know, I hate to say it, but unfortunately there are some dietitians out there who maybe don't believe that all foods fit. And that's really hard for me. I think as someone who has struggled with disordered eating in the past and has seen loved ones around me struggle with 
with eating disorders and disordered eating, you know, I truly do see the benefit of, you know, yeah, I'm going to have a donut on a Saturday morning with my boyfriend, you know, and, and enjoy that and not feel guilty about it. And so that's kind of the philosophy that, that I have for myself and that I try to portray to other people is that, you know, you can eat something and not feel guilty about it. And you can, you know, really try to truly listen to your body as long as you're fueling enough, which I think is, you know, a lot of people just think, oh, you know, I'm probably overeating, I'm probably overeating, but especially athletes, the majority of the time they're under eating, you know, so making sure that they are fueling their bodies adequately and things like that. Yeah, I love it. And um, as you mentioned, like in your personal life, you really love cooking and stuff. And that's one of my favorite things about your Instagram account. Actually, you're always putting out recipes, <laughs> which is really fun. And and uh, it's a great inspiration. So we'll include it in the show notes, but it's at follow your gut RD, right? Yeah. Correct. Which I feel like I feel like it's like a play on work because it's like follow it your is. gut, like your gut health and everything, <laughs> nutrition. But it's also like your gut is your instinct. And when we talk about like your, you know, intuitive eating, which is something you're very passionate about, it's like that makes sense too. Just like follow your gut, follow what intuitively you're wanting right now. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> that was the whole point. So my old Instagram name used to be Peanut Butter and Ken's and I would just post recipes. And I made I made that back in college and had it for years and years. And then actually when I reached out to you after you spoke at the CPSDA conference and I was telling you, you know, I'm interested in gut health and also the disordered eating component and intuitive eating. And I kind of like thought about it a little bit more. And actually my boyfriend came up with the follow your gut thing. And I was like, wait, that's perfect. Yes. <laughs> so I went with it because I was like, yeah, like my two biggest interests in nutrition are intuitive eating and gut health. So it really combines the two. It's perfect. And it gives me kind of that platform to, to, yeah, share the things that I love, share the, the recipes that I maybe you know, got from my mom or maybe just made up on my own or, you know, found online and kind of tweaked my own thing. I definitely like to be creative, but then I also have been trying to do more like education kind of things on there and, you know, support on the intuitive eating side of things as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how did you first get into intuitive eating? Because, you know, as dietitians, we're really not taught that in our schooling at all, like zero, <laughs> zero education on it, zero. And I would, I would go to the extent of saying zero support in it as yeah. well. Right. Yeah, so how did you come to find that that was such a huge part of your nutrition philosophy and how you wanted to take your career? So when I was at Virginia Tech, I worked really closely with Jenny Zabinski, who was previously the director at Virginia Tech. And then she um, kind of worked like consulting for them. And she has her own private practice now in Blacksburg as well. And she was not only, you know, a coworker and someone that I really looked up to and kind of went to for a lot of advice during that time. But she was also my professor for one of my classes. <laughs> so I was able to learn a lot from her in terms of like intuitive eating and haze and things like that. And I really feel like I adapted a lot of that mindset from her. And then when COVID first hit and it was like, okay, we're all stuck at home. What can we do to still better ourselves? Like obviously as dietitians, we have to do continuing education every year or every six years, five years, whatever it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have to, often. you know, <laughs> we have to stay on top of that stuff. And we were like, how can we kind of better, what, where are our gaps right now, basically? And we discovered that it was eating disorder, disordered eating. And so we got the Marcy Evans eating disorder program to, to watch and take notes on. And we had discussions every week and that really helped me kind of like dive deeper into it and really like opened up my eyes. And then I was like, okay, you know, I want to read Evelyn Triboli's book. I want to, you know, listen to these podcasts. I want to do all this exploration on my own. And, and during that time, I actually was when I started eat, eating intuitively myself. It's funny because I feel like a lot of people COVID hit and it kind of damaged the relationship with food and yeah. or their bodies. Oh yeah. And, and that's still like, to, to this day, clients that we are enrolling today, when I ask them, like, when did their problems with nutrition start? It's like, well, when the pandemic started. Yeah, I, this might go on for a while, unfortunately. And it's not the only reason, but it's certainly <laughs> a part of it. So you you took the opportunity of the pandemic hitting, maybe having more free time and stuff like that to to really help you with your own nutrition journey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it was beneficial for me. I know that it caused a lot of harm for a lot of people, which, 
you know, I hate to see, but yeah, like you said, a lot of people who are joining the group and a lot of athletes who I've been meeting with, you know, when did this start? Well, when the pandemic hit and I wasn't able to exercise normally, or I started spending more time on TikTok, you know, these things like we joke about it, but they really do have a huge impact on us. Funny what you just said, because yes, TikTok came out the same time as the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. That was kind of when it like really exploded. Oh my God. Yeah. It was her. And so I, my clients at that time were like, Lindsay, you got to get on TikTok because there's so much <laughs> bad, there's so much bad nutrition stuff going on there. And I tried for a hot minute and I really, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like making the videos. I didn't, I honestly like didn't have, even though like I love being on camera and I love <laughs> talking and I'm a very like energetic, like person. I love dancing and I love music. And I, I don't, I didn't have fun making the videos because to me, I'm no, I'm getting totally off topic, but to me, all the TikTok videos were like, they're so inauthentic because you're copying someone else or you're like, you know, mouthing to a song and it just like, not, I don't know. It was so like inauthentic to me. And then, um, also like, even though social media could is, and is a great platform for my business. And I do use it on Instagram. So it was like, Oh, use it on TikTok, And you can really like expand your business that way and reach people and help people and have an influence. And I really just was like, so busy with work that I was like, there's no way <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah, there's no way I can add this one more thing. So I did feel bad for all my clients that were like, Lindsay, there's so much bad nutrition stuff. Get on there. And I was like, I'm sorry. I'm letting you down, but I cannot. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a lot. I know some people who actually do make like true content and it is time consuming. I have made like maybe five like stupid little videos that, you know, I don't actually put time into them. But I think it is important to note too, like how you said, a lot of clients are saying like, there's so much bad on there. It is an algorithm. So, you know, the things that you're liking, watching, interacting with, commenting on, those are the posts that are going to continue showing up on your feed. So for me, if I'm scrolling through and I see uh, what I eat in the day post, I'm going to like scroll past or, or block that account. You know, I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to unfollow. And that I think has been really good for my mental health both not only on TikTok, but also like Instagram and, and Twitter and things like that. I, I The second I see something that makes me feel bad or that I don't like, unfollow. You know, I don't want to bring that sort of negativity. negativity. It goes back to, you know, what you're surrounding yourself with really impacts you so much. So you have to be really smart about those choices, even on social media. And that's why following your account is so helpful for people. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mackenzie. Yeah, I do the same thing. I do the instant unfollow whenever I get that gut feeling, right? Follow your gut. Whenever you get the gut <laughs> feeling of like, Ugh, now I'm not happy. Now I don't feel good. Now I feel insecure. Now I feel like I'm not good enough. Now I'm questioning and doubting myself. I do an instant unfollow. And not only is that good for the sake of not being exposed to that, that person, that stuff. But it's also when you got, you get that bad feeling, it's also an instant like, yes, I just did something good and you feel instantly better. So I'm a huge fan of the instant unfollow. <laughs> I agree. It really, it's like very gratifying because it's like, no, I don't support that. So you know what? You, you lost a follower. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I unfortunately and- have had to do that with friends who, you know, maybe went down like a really diet culture path. And all of a sudden they're making those sorts of TikTok videos. And I'm like, you know what? I don't, this isn't for me. So I'm going to go ahead and unfollow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's totally okay. Right. Different strokes for different folks. I think, you know, people have unfollowed me. People have not liked my content, not resonated with it. And it's like, we all have to just know what's best for ourselves. And we, that's the crazy thing with social media is you're exposed to everything and everybody. It doesn't, it doesn't work and not, not everybody's going to agree. Not, and in some ways it's good to expose yourself to, of course we need to be exposed to different opinions than our own, but it's like at, at what in, it's intensified with social media. It is so intensified. You are seeing hundreds and thousands of things and content and people that if it was just you and your personal life, you wouldn't have chosen to see that or engage with that. And so we have to create as much control around it as we can. I think if not, if not for this business, I really wouldn't be on social media, right? Right before I started Rise of Nutrition, I took a big hiatus from my personal account, which is really, really funny because in having 
in having Gabe, <laughs> I didn't want to overwhelm the Rise Up Nutrition account, the at Female Athlete Nutrition. I did not want to overwhelm it with baby pictures, but I'm like, I do want to post baby pictures so my family <laughs> can see. Like my aunts, I have, oh my gosh, I have like 20 cousins and aunts and uncles. And so- and I can't I also like, love a good baby picture. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, so I was like, you know, and I'm, te- I'm texting my family pictures, but like, I can't text all my family, extended family. So I was like, I will go back to my old personal account. I had not posted in like three and a half years I oh, wow. on that account, but <laughs> it is officially t- transformed into baby account now. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Work account and baby account. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I totally digress. Um, <laughs> but no, that was a good path we went down with the social media stuff. And and yes, your account is a great one to follow. And I think it, it shows another one of your strengths of like getting in the kitchen and, and using unique ingredients and putting meals together. And as you said before, one of your philosophies is having fun with food. And it's like, you are really in, engaging with your food, I guess I would say, and like exploring with it, you know? Yeah. Definitely. And I really do, you know, that intuitive eating component. Sometimes I will make a whole meal like gourmet. It'll be beautiful. I take a picture and then all of a sudden I'm like, I take one bite and I'm like, you know what? This isn't what I want. Like, And I, I won't force myself to eat it. Yes, sometimes we have to, you know, we don't have time and things like that. But there have been times when I have done that and I put it away and I've poured myself a bowl of cereal. So, you know, that's, I think, the side of it that people don't see, you know, yes, I, I do love the food that I cook, but I'm not necessarily eating that way every single night, because that wouldn't be intuitive of me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like you sharing that. Yeah. Like as much as you are getting in the kitchen, and everything, sometimes you do just have a bowl of cereal for dinner and that's okay when it's, it's what works for you and your body and everything. Okay, fans, I'm going to pause this conversation to let you ladies know about the Rise Up Nutrition Coaching Program. We have a lot of ways that we can help clients here at Rise Up Nutrition. And this is one of two amazing opportunities to get the direct help you need. With our team of sports dietitians, this program helps adult female athletes fuel to perform without strict dieting. Ah, how good does that sound? Finally, you will understand nutrition for day-to-day training. Eat intuitively with foods that you love and be race day or competition day ready with energy and confidence. We have more details about what's included and how we can help on our website, riseupnutritionrun.com slash group coaching. Links are in the show notes, but I quickly want to share what a few of our clients have said about their experiences in this program so far. Sophie, a trail runner, says, quote, I really encourage anyone who has struggled with eating and lives an active lifestyle to consider this program because it's so hard to know if you're fueling properly without someone on the outside looking in from an objective point of view. I now feel confident in my food choices and more than anything, confident that I can actually eat more and that it will only benefit my health and my training. Sarah, another one of our clients and triathlete, says, quote, For anyone that is struggling with diet culture, a history of disordered eating, and is trying to learn how to eat and fuel, this is a program they should strongly consider. I've been active my whole life and trying to fit a mainstream diet has never worked. In fact, it's created more problems than good. Working with Rise Up Nutrition has made things very simple. So again, if you are an adult female athlete that wants to perform better without strict dieting, click that link in our show notes to apply to the Rise Up Nutrition Coaching Program, and we would be thrilled to have you join us. Until then, we will get back to the conversation. So tell our listeners a bit more about your your volleyball history, because that's a big part of your life. And I'm sure that also like, even though when you were, you went to study engineering, like, I feel like it must've, did it have any correlate? Like, were you interested in nutrition at all just because of being an athlete at that time? Cause this was before, before, you know? Right. I really wasn't, I didn't know anything about it, but full transparency. When I came home, like, uh, in between fall and spring semester, my freshman year of college. And like the first time that my high school best friends and I all hung out, they were all like, 
you're switching your major to dietetics, like you of all people, the girl who doesn't like water and who drinks soda every day. And I, I had a very <laughs> interesting diet for the first 18 years of my life. So, you know, I was a really, really picky eater as a kid. I didn't understand the concept of like being full. So I would eat past fullness all the time, but I was always so active. So it didn't really, you know, impact my weight or anything. So it wasn't therefore seen as a problem because it wasn't impacting my weight. I look back now and I'm like, wow, that was terrible that I was doing that to myself, but I didn't know any better. So, so no, I really didn't have much of an interest in nutrition before. It was purely just kind of my love of, of the sport and love of volleyball. And I just kind of got lucky, I guess. It's funny because I mean, so I, I played uh, lots of sports. I was a swimmer, did softball, did basketball. I tried tennis. I tried soccer. You know, I've kind of done a little bit of everything, but the ones that I played the longest were volleyball, basketball, swimming, and softball. And then I got to high school and I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to dedicate just to volleyball. That was my main sport. And before every volleyball game, my, at my high school, my, one of my best friends and I, who is still one of my best friends to this day, we would split a bag of M&Ms. And it's funny because at first I was probably like, this isn't, you know, I didn't think much of it, but looking back, I'm like, you know what? there were some quick carbs in there. (laughs) Like that kind of worked for me, even though I really had no idea what I was doing. That was a habit that I got into more. I feel like out of a ritual than anything else. We would also have an energy drink with it, but (laughs) yeah, (laughs) that far not so much. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think back to when I was a a gymnast when I was younger, because I, st- well, I, I did gymnastics all the way through high school, but uh, we had these long practices. And what was not good is that I like never brought a snack with me. And that was, you know, for four hour practices and I never brought a snack with me, but there was a vending machine <laughs> in the gym <laughs> and between the Skittles and the Starburst, which is funny because that's like my least favorite candy. Like I'm such a chocolate yeah. that non chocolate <laughs> yeah non chocolate candy like kind of doesn't make sense to me i'm like what's the I'm point the of the same it? way <laughs> <laughs> with the exception of candy corn that's that has a special place in my heart but yeah so like in any situation in life i'm like eh, skittles whatever except for during gymnastics practice like i was like foaming at the mouth for my skittles <laughs> like and i realized now in hindsight i'm like wow that was so good because I needed that sugar. Yeah, so thank exactly. goodness I brought my 50 cents to practice every day to go to the <laughs> vending machine, but also not good. I should have packed like, you know, a cliff bar or something too. You know? But yeah, maybe subconsciously we kind of knew what we were doing there, I guess. <laughs> well, and that goes right in line with your passion of intuitive eating right now. Like actually your body does know sometimes. It's very true. I never really thought about it before. And I mean, even in college, like once I started playing while I was learning about nutrition, I still don't really feel like I was necessarily applying what I was learning in school to what I was doing in sport at that time. And I think there's two reasons for that. I think one of them is that we really don't learn that much about sports nutrition in undergrad, like sports nutrition, eating disorders, disordered eating, intuitive eating, haze, like those are all things that they, that's not part of your undergrad curriculum. Like if you want to know that stuff, you have to take additional classes. You have to do extra webinars and things like that. Get a master's, become an assistant, an intern, get years of experience, like unpaid and do tons of webinars (laughs) and continuing education. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, so I didn't have that, that component. And then I think the other part of it was college was when my relationship with food was at its worst. So that was definitely a component for me as well. And what was that like for you, just for our listeners to hear and relate to you? What was, what was the hardest part about your relationship with nutrition while you were a college athlete? So I kind of started down a dangerous spiral once after I switched to dietetics. I had like one semester under my belt. So I was in starting out my sophomore year and I will never forget. I was walking with another one of my good friends who is also or was also a dietetics major is also a dietitian now. And we had both gained weight freshman year of college, as a lot of people do. And we were kind of walking home from class one day and we were like, we're dietitians. Like, we have to be thin. We have to be healthy. You know, what are we doing? And so we were like, we're going to both lose weight. You know, we're going to do this together kind of thing. And we did. We both lost a significant amount of weight. But I will never say that it was in a healthy way whatsoever. You know, like I said earlier, I was a big soda kid. So the first thing I did was cut out soda. (laughs) Um, And then it kind of spiraled from there. And next thing you know, I'm measuring everything that I'm eating. 
I'm putting all of my food into my fitness pal and saving my calories for alcohol because I was in college. Also someone who likes to go out and have fun. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was kind of doing all those sort of behaviors and and I actually lost about 30 pounds in less than a year while I was still playing a sport. So like not not super great. And, and, you know, it wasn't like it was helping my performance or anything at all. I was more and more fatigued. I wasn't as strong. So it was, you know, definitely hindering me more than anything else. And it impacted my relationships with people around me. You know, I had gotten to a lot of fights with people about things. And I think I kind of tried to deny that it was really an issue. And then it got to the Especially point because you're a nutrition major. It's like, exactly. So it's like, Oh, I'm, you know, I know what I'm doing. Like, it's hard to admit. And, and oh, I yeah, totally have that typical, like, you know, I'm very type A, I, I don't want to let people down kind of thing. So I think that was also my mindset as well. And then I got to the point where I remember I had food poisoning really bad. And I lost like a couple extra pounds because I couldn't eat anything but ginger ale and crackers for like a week. And I was happy that that happened because I was like, well, like, you know, my weight's down a little bit more again and kind of like viewed that as a good thing. And then I started like chewing food and spitting it out. And, you know, I never got to the purging component, but I was like, this is not good. So I I kind of started to realize, but as we know, those habits are hard to break. And then this is going to sound a little crazy, but I actually got in a car accident, which was really terrifying. And I had like that moment of like, oh my God, life is too short. Like, what am I doing? I love pizza. I love ice cream, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so my, I had to go to the hospital. My parents picked me up, brought me back to their house. Luckily, like I went to college only like half an hour from my parents' house. And my dad ordered pizza that night. And I distinctly remember I ate like three pieces of pepperoni pizza. And I was like, all right, never going back, you know? (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Well, I don't love that story and the, and the car accident, but I love that you pizza. ate pizza and that it was almost like, you know, I don't know that it's that easy for everybody. I'm not, not to say it was easy, but it was almost like there was a moment that you decided. Yeah. You I know, which is, that. yes, I love that, that it was like you found it, you just decided. And from then on, you know, things changed. Mm hmm. Exactly. And it's not to say that I didn't have my struggles after that. I, I struggled a lot with body image and in so much better of a place now, better than I ever was in my entire life. So like that's some, that's a huge win, something to be excited about. I think one of the things that kind of helped me like put my foot down and be like, okay, this needs to stop is that my aunt did suffer from bulimia really severely to the point where it, you know, ruined her relationship with my mom. You know, she was in and out of treatment. They like so many kind of family issues. And so I think that unfortunately was kind of a thing in the back of my mind of like, you know, you don't want that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing these stories too, because I think there's whether it's other dietitians or RDs to be who are listening to, to this episode we do feel that pressure to uphold some sort of standard of health or whether it be other personal trainers or doctors, even like sometimes we feel that pressure to uphold a standard of health athletes. I should just say their athletes feel the pressure to uphold like, Oh, I'm, I'm healthy because I'm an athlete or I look a certain way because I'm an athlete. And so you as a dietitian felt that pressure of like, shouldn't I be good at weight loss? I'm a, I'm a dietitian or I'm studying to be a dietitian. And that was very much me too. When I, when I did struggle in college as well, what was frustrating about it. And I struggled because I was, I was injured. I was an athlete. I was injured and I was, you know, just gaining weight. And I was like, how come I can't control this? Like I'm studying nutrition. I know how to count calories. I know how to put myself on a diet. And I was, and yet for me, I had the opposite of you, which is I, in putting myself on a diet, wasn't losing weight and continued to gain, which was even more frustrating. And you just feel like this doesn't work. And I, and we both came to the conclusion it's because we don't like diets. We're (laughs) dietitians that don't like diets. (laughs) Anti-diet dietitian. (laughs) If I had to describe myself in three words, that's it. (laughs) Yes. Anti-diet dietitians. And, but another thing too, like, cause some people, I never want to discredit the people who want weight loss and might even benefit from a health or performance perspective, right? And I'm saying this with caution only because I'm always so like, 
don't like, don't focus on weight loss, focus on performance, which is, is still my philosophy and my truth and what we preach in our programming. But it doesn't mean that we're, so we can be anti, what I'm trying to say is we can be anti-diet dietitians and that does not mean anti-weight loss or anti-love your body, right? But we have to do it in a different way. Like the way that you did it was not healthy, right? Right. And that's the thing. It's like when people are like, but I want to lose weight. It's like, okay, you can lose weight, but what's that going to do to you? Is that really going to give you the end goal that you're looking for? Exactly. And so we have to really think about what is the true outcome that we want? Is it just a number or is it something more important than that? And um, if you're really thinking long and hard about this, it's something more important than that what you want is to have confidence. What you want is to do better at your sport. What you want is to feel good in your body day to day. What you want is to be energized. What you want is to be loved and accepted. And just achieving weight loss is not going to accomplish all those things inherently. You right. Know. And most of the time, if someone says, you know, oh, I, I'll be happy as soon as I lose those five pounds, those 10 pounds, whatever it may be. It's like, where did you even get that number from? You know, and, and all of a sudden, five turns to 10, 10 turns to 20, you're still not happy. You know, I think it's really important, you know, what to determine what that driving factor is, like you said, you know, what's really the reason. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's your personal story definitely makes you even I think every Everybody who's a coach, it helps to have a personal, you know, experience with these things. We know the textbook, we know the science, we know what we learned in classes, we know what we've learned in our job experiences. And then it's like going through those, you know, steps yourself and walking the walk is what helps you really guide your clients too. Exactly. Definitely. You know, I couldn't do this. I don't think at least, you know, to the extent if I didn't go through those experiences, because it is helpful to kind of have that connection of like, you know, I have been there, I've been in your shoes, I get it. And I know that it's hard. But like, if anything, I hope that, you know, when I do share this with clients, it's kind of a, okay, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, I can, I can, she can get there, I can get there too. Absolutely. So I I love putting people on the spot, but (laughs) what is your favorite part about the work you do with Rise Up Nutrition? I think it's, pretty much kind of what we've like talked about. It's just being able to help people. It's being able to like see those little changes, you know, those wins that people post in their check-ins or in the group chat. It's seeing just the impact that we're able to make with them. Yeah. Yeah. The impact and the lives improved and transformed for the better, for the better. Those light bulb moments. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So Mackenzie, as you know, we end every podcast with some fun questions. So (laughs) now it's your turn. If there is one food you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would that be? It would be ice cream. (laughs) Yes, definitely a podcast favorite. favorite. Yeah, (laughs) Podcast favorite is ice cream for sure. What's your favorite flavor ice cream? So it depends. It depends on the brand. (laughs) Oh, yeah, totally. So I'm a big fan of Talenti black raspberry chocolate chip, Turkey Hill mint chocolate chip. If I go to like an ice cream shop, I'm the type of person who will get like all the fun random flavors. Like I never, I'm not like, oh, I have to get cookies and cream or I have to get cookie dough. I'm like, let me try this cool random blueberry pie goat cheese ice cream, which (laughs) actually was one that my boyfriend and I tried and it's really good. (laughs) Wow. So I like to be adventurous. Yeah. So it's funny you said the Turkey Hill mint chocolate chip because I only recently tried the Talenti mint chocolate chip, which is like, it's white, not green, right? Yeah. It's always like when you get mint chocolate chip, is it going to be white or is it going to be green? And I thought that one, I thought, yeah, I thought the Talenti one, which was white, I thought that was actually one of the best mint chocolate chips I've ever had. It is really good. But if you haven't had the Turkey Hill, because I actually recently learned that Turkey Hill isn't all over the country. I thought that it was, but it's not, as no. I move around, I've learned that it's not. But the reason it's so good is because the chocolate is shaved, not chips. So it like oh. melts in your mouth. I have had that. <laughs> I'm remembering that. One it's now. my yes. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I've lived in Massachusetts, Florida, Georgia, and now Texas. And so I, I know that not every ice cream brand is everywhere. And it's frustrating because my favorite ice cream brand is Friendly's, which is only up in New England, like Massachusetts. Really? Yeah. We have those in Delaware too. Oh, you do? Okay, mm-hmm. good. And then, oh man, have I been down the rabbit hole on Google trying to figure out the darn difference between Briars and Dryers ice cream. <laughs> um, have you ever been down that rabbit hole before? I have not. I've I've seen Briars. I don't think I know Dryers. 
okay, well, there's a dryer. <laughs> and they're two different company. I, I get confused. And the, one of the, oh yeah, I have to do it again. I've, I've, you'll start researching it. Listeners can be like, what the heck, Lindsay, you're so crazy. But they're like spelt the same, but one's with a B, one's with a D and they're actually competing companies. So but then I'm pretty sure it's Briars is the same as Edie's. I was going to say Edie's is another one. Yeah. It's like Edie's and Briars are the same and Dryers, which is spelt like Briars, but with a D is different. They're in, co- they literally like, they like copied each other's names mm-hmm. just to be like in competition. <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we'll move on from this topic, but when you're it's an important topic. <laughs> it is. And it's for, when you find your favorite brand and favorite flavor and then you move, it's, it can be devastating. Yeah. So. <laughs> Actually, me and one of my clients have talked about this a lot because she was also from, well, New York, Massachusetts area, and then moved out to Colorado. And she was the same as me of like, I miss friendlies. And every time she goes home, it's like, got to get my friendlies. Yeah, that's funny. I do also love Jenny's. I've recently tried that as well. I've never heard of that one. It's expensive, but it's delicious. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I feel like Ben and Jerry's is one of the few that has done really well at like being nationwide, probably Ben and Jerry's and like Haagen-Dazs. Yeah. Which I do also love as well. You know, never met an ice cream I didn't like. There's just some I love more than others. (laughs) I am on board. I've never met an ice cream I didn't like either. (laughs) Oh, actually, no, that's false. Arctic Zero. Okay. Yes. Didn't like that, but that's not ice cream. I agree. (laughs) Halo Top, like... I think the first time I tried Halo Top, I was like, oh, this is pretty good. And well, admittedly, I think I did eat Halo Top a lot when I was like still kind of entrenched in diet culture myself. And so definitely I remember the red velvet flavor, like thinking it was really good. And it's hilarious because if I eat it now, I'm like, I did the exact same thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, no, I, and especially because it's like $5 for a pint. I'm never, I'm literally... Yeah, vowing that I will never buy, never buy that again. No desire. <laughs> no desire. No desire. Okay, we'll move on from ice cream. I should probably have like an ice cream representative on this podcast someday. <laughs> okay. And people are going to be like, isn't this the athlete nutrition podcast? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Okay, next question, Mackenzie. What is your favorite sport to participate in? Volleyball, <laughs> which probably comes to no shock. But I will say I do also love playing football. So just to throw oh, something really? different in there. Yeah. I yeah, haven't done it in yeah. a while, but I like to play when I can. <laughs> yeah. Like traditional football or like ultimate, like, um, no, yeah, like okay. intramural flag football. <laughs> flag football. Yeah. Cause I was we like, played in a- college and I pride myself on it because it was like a co-ed intramural team and every, a girl basically had to touch the ball every other play and every other team would be like, oh my gosh, every other play, like we're going to lose the ball. But I was our quarterback every other play and our team won the championship. So <laughs> amazing. Yes. Yeah, see female athletes pulling through in rec leagues and flag football. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. And how about as a spectator, what's your favorite sport to watch on the sidelines? Hockey is actually my favorite sport to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I distinctly remember my very first Flyers game. <laughs> I love it. I was wearing my Bruins shirt earlier today that said <laughs> it was, I should have taken, I, I meant to take a picture and post it on social, but I forgot. So I was wearing a Bruins shirt that says beer hockey as I'm like pushing my baby in the stroller. And I was like, I am not embodying <laughs> this lifestyle right now. <laughs> like, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Like wearing the shirt, but this is not my life right now. But we love hockey. And how about Mackenzie, if there's a female athlete out there that you want to give a shout out to for being a great role model or being especially fierce, fit and fueled, who would that be and why? It's a hard one, but I would have to say Mary Kane. Because I think like her coming out and speaking out about, you know, her experiences with Nike was so impactful. And unfortunately, we all know that like the nature of running like really does flow with diet culture, disordered eating, eating disorders. And so for someone at her caliber to to speak out about how that has negatively impacted her, I think is really, really important. And that helps, you know, young girls see and be like, you know, I I know that this is not the way that I want to go. I know that I need to fuel my body properly to perform. Mm -hmm. And I can 100% say that Mary Kane is fierce, fit and fueled since she (laughs) has been and is a client of Rise Up Nutrition. So I actually didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't know if you knew that since you said that. Yeah. Yeah. No, she, uh, because it was obviously before you started 
working with us here, but she, yeah, a couple years ago, she, and she, we still talk about her nutrition one-on-one, but she actually even went through the female athlete system of transformation programming and worked. And I was her dietitian to guide her through and not just in her Red S recovery, but actually her return to running, coming, coming back and being stronger and yeah. And then she had surgery as well. So I kind of helped her through that. So anyways, I'm just saying like, I love that for you. She, you are giving her that shout out because she is such a role model. And then I'm backing that up and saying hundred percent, she's fierce, fit and fueled. Her nutrition is she's doing so good. And she's such a role That's model awesome. for so many people. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Oh, Mackenzie, thank you so much. You will be back on the podcast in the future, but right now you're super busy leading all of our <laughs> clients to success. And so again, there's me, Mackenzie and Jenna as our nutrition coaches here at Rise Up Nutrition. And Mackenzie right now, at least we'll say right now, is specifically working with all the amazing ladies who are in our Rise Up Nutrition group coaching program. So if you are a female athlete in any sport at any level and feel like you just need to know more about how to fuel your body for performance, but you want to do it in a way that isn't with dieting or counting calories, you want to shift away from focusing on weight and onto performance and how you feel. You want to get out of diet culture and into intuitive eating while still caring about how your body moves and performs. Then this is the program for you. And Mackenzie is one of our amazing coaches that will guide you to success and really help you find transformational results. So Mackenzie, we are so glad you're on the team. Welcome to your first podcast episode (laughs) and we'll have many more in the future. Thank you. I can't wait to be back on and chat again. (laughs) I really hope you enjoyed that episode and thanks for listening. But before I let you go, I have free resources that you can have access to right away, right now, so that you can start fueling your body as a fierce, fit and fueled female athlete. First, I have your Red S recovery race. If you've ever wondered if you might be struggling with Red S, curious to learn more, or know you have Red S and are looking to recover fast, then you can head to www.riseupnutritionrun.com slash Red S and download the Red S Recovery Race. See how you place and figure out the next steps to recovery. Plus, while there, I have a few other great resources for you, including three nutrition secrets that every elite athlete swears by and access to our private Facebook community, Female Athlete Nutrition. So again, to gain access to all of this, head to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S that's backslash R E D S. And you can gain access and get the help you need fast. Too many girls and women and female athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer become fierce, fit and fueled links in the show notes, and I'll see you next time.